Greetings, everyone. Thank you for your call and response. Greetings, everyone. Why, thank you. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Difficult Dialogues in Higher Education, a panel discussion on race, racial justice, civil discourse, and free speech. My name is Dr. Candace M. Moore, and I serve as a clinical assistant professor in the Counseling Higher Education and Special Education Program in the College of Education. I am also the director of the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education. I'd first like to take a moment to acknowledge the sacred land of the Piscataway people upon which we're gathered here today. Let us pause and take a moment for reflection. Thank you. The center is proud to sponsor tonight's panel discussion, hosted as a part of the Voices of Social Change series with our friends in leadership and community service learning here in the Stamp Student Union. Um, the Voices series honors local as well as national people who are committed to bringing to campus discussions that focus on social issues for students, faculty, and staff, as well as community members, and helping them to discover ways in which they can engage in positive change. Thank you to the Voices team for helping to make tonight's event possible. This panel also serves as the opening plenary for the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center's biannual conference. We are proud to host, their, host them here, rather, here at the University of Maryland's campus as they engage in learning and development on the important topics of increasing connection between community as well as understanding through dialogue. Welcome to all conference attendees. I would now like to take a moment to introduce to the stage the Dean of the College, Dr. Jennifer King Rice. Thank you, Dr. Moore. On behalf of the College of Education at the University of Maryland, I would like to welcome you all to tonight's panel discussion. We are honored to have members of our Maryland family and the Difficult Dialogues National Research Center join together for this important conversation. The Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education was established in 2017 and is situated in the Counseling, Higher Education, and Special Education Department, affectionately known as CHESI, in the College of Education at the University of Maryland. Our CHESI faculty are actively engaged in leading the work of the center and the college is thrilled to have this center as part of our strategic initiatives. The center's research, I'm sorry, the center's focus on research, policy, professional standards, and consultation for universities on critical issues related to equity and diversity in higher education directly aligns with the social justice mission of our College of Education. We are excited about the active role the center's taking to advance diversity, inclusion, and social justice in research and practice, both within our college community as well as across the field nationally. In alignment with this mission, the center is hosting the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center Biennial Conference here at the University of Maryland this week. I'd like to take just a moment to thank Dr. Roger Worthington and Dr. Candace Moore and their small but mighty team for their excellent leadership of the center and their efforts to organize this meeting. I want to thank this panel of distinguished scholars and public intellectuals who will be introduced momentarily. And I'd like to thank you all for being here and for your engagement in these critical issues. At this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kelly Maxwell, chair of the DDNRC's board of directors to this stage to share a few words. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, am a Big Ten colleague from the University of Michigan, so I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome and thank our distinguished panelists for being here tonight. 
and to thank the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education and the entire University of Maryland community for working with us to host this panel in association with the DDNRC National Conference. In 2011, the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center was formed to support the integration of teaching and learning about difficult dialogues into university missions across the United States and across the world. We are a virtual center where thought leaders in higher education come together to strengthen a democratically engaged society by advancing innovative practices in higher education that promote respectful, transformative dialogue on controversial issues and complex social topics. We are meeting here at the University of Maryland over the next several days to discuss the theme of engaging difficult dialogues in higher education in the digital age. What is the impact of the 24-7 news cycle on our face-to-face -face interaction? What are the implications of our online presence on issues of free speech and civil discourse? How do we help our students, you, build skills to engage in the many difficult dialogues that face this nation today? These are critical questions, and we will explore these topics and more together over the next two days. And we invite you to join us tomorrow morning at the Marriott if you'd like to extend your thinking about tonight's topics. So thank you again for having us. And with that, I would like to introduce tonight's moderator, who will then introduce our panelists. Dr. Roger L. Worthington is professor in the Department of Counseling, Higher Education, and Special Education at the University of Maryland. And as you've already heard, executive director of the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education. He was the recipient of three prestigious grants from the Ford Foundation Difficult Dialogues Initiative and the founding chair of the board of directors for the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center. Dr. Worthington was also a founding member of the board of directors for the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education and co-authored the Standards of Professional Practice for Chief Diversity Officers. He is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and the outgoing editor of the Journal of Diversity in Higher Education. He received his doctorate in counseling psychology in 1995 from the University of California at Santa Barbara. So please help me welcome Dr. Roger Worthington. All right, so um, this is the opening plenary, as you've heard, for the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center 2018 Biennial Conference. And it is sponsored by the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education and hosted by the Voices of Social Change series of the Leadership and Service Learning Program at UMD. Uh, race, racial justice, civil discourse, and free speech. These are concepts that have become controversial topics across higher education. These four major facets of life in the US should not really truly be incompatible, yet the nature of the current political climate seems to artificially place them in opposition. College and university campuses across the country have become battlegrounds for the culture wars in ways that confound the fundamental mission of higher education. This highly interactive panel and audience discussion uh, asks whether we are moving inevitably toward greater polarization across issues of race, class, religion, and political orientation, or whether there is a path toward unification. I was gonna say reunification, but we might have to debate whether or not reunification is really truly the right word. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Um, the, this panel discussion, I think, really comes at a pivotal time in modern day American history as political and racial divisions have really swept the country from the Washington DC area to college and university campuses all across country. 
So we've brought together some of the nation's most profound thought leaders to participate in our panel discussion. And without any further delay, let me introduce our panelists this evening. Michelle Norris is a Peabody award-winning journalist, founder of the Raced Card Project, and executive director of The Bridge, the Aspen Institute's new program on race, identity, connectivity, and inclusion. For more than a decade, Norris served as, the, as one of the hosts of NPR's All Things Considered, where she interviewed world leaders, American presidents, Nobel laureates, leading thinkers, and groundbreaking artists. She created the Race Card Project, an initiative to foster a wider conversation about race in America after the publication of her family memoir, The Grace of Silence. Jelani Cobb is an award-winning journalist, educator, and diversity speaker who writes about the enormous complexity of race in America. A longtime staff writer at The New Yorker, Cobb has written a remarkable series of articles about race and the police and injustice. He teaches in the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and he is the author of several books, among them being Substance of Hope, Barack Obama, and the Paradox of Progress, To the Break of Dawn, a freestyle on the hip hop aesthetic, <laughs> and The Devil and Dave Chappelle and other essays. Welcome, Jel Jelani Cobb. Carolyn Lukensmeyer is the executive director of the National Institute for Civil Discourse, an organization that works to reduce political dysfunction and incivility in our political system. Lots of work these days. <laughs> As a leader in the field of deliberative democracy, she works to restore our democracy to reflect the intended vision of our founding fathers. Dr. Lukensmeyer previously served as founder and president of America Speaks, an award-winning nonprofit organization that promoted nonpartisan initiatives to engage citizens and leaders through the development of innovative public policy tools and strategies. And finally, Suzanne Nossel, currently serves as the Chief Executive Officer of PEN America, a leading human rights and free expression organization. She is a leading voice on free expression issues in the US and globally, writing and being interviewed frequently for national and international media outlets. Her prior career spanned government service and leadership roles in corporate and nonprofit sectors and she served as the Chief Operating Officer of Human Rights Watch, as well as Executive Director of Amnesty International USA. Please join me now in welcoming our panelists. So I'm gonna begin uh, with a question for each one of our panelists in turn. Um, so let's get started. We'll start with Michelle Norris. Uh, Michelle, let's talk very briefly about the Race Card Project and uh, The Bridge, your newest endeavor at the Aspen Institute on Race. Um, you created the Race Card Project as an initiative to foster a wider conversation about race in America, and now The Bridge at the Aspen Institute with the goal to access the stories, people, and threads that make up our complex cultural landscape um, to get Americans to talk across difference. Um, to address issues of race and inclusion and identity. So what's going on in this country around race? Why is it so difficult for people in the United States to talk about race and racial tensions? I created the Race Card Project because I thought no one wanted to talk about race. And I wound up creating the project, which is a six-word exercise. We asked people to share six words on race and identity. Sounds simple, but try to condense your own story about identity to just six words and you realize how you have to explore your own complexity and your own story to figure that out. And we did it because we thought no one wanted to talk about race and I was wrong. Actually, a lot of people do want to talk about race and cultural identity. They're looking for a brave and a safe space to do it. And so what we try to do is use this archive. We created the project eight years ago and we now have archived more than 250,000 stories from all 50 states in 92 countries, actually I think it's up to 96 countries, um, and thousands of stories waiting in queue to be officially archived. 
And we try to use those stories as the scaffolding for conversations and dialogue and exploration so people can explore a perspective outside of their own. It's a narrative exchange, uh, a project based on narrative exchange to allow people to explore different experiences and perspectives. And you talk about how people perhaps want to talk about race. Well, what we try to do is also provide a vehicle for people to listen, mm -hmm. to explore someone else's idea, to actually just understand, give someone else space to tell their story and learn from their story. And our work is, is, I guess, could be encapsulated by the Alfred Einstein quote that the mind, once it encounters a new idea, never returns to its, its original size. Mm -hmm. So you might not agree with the story that you hear. You, you might never cross that bridge and stay there. But if you cross that proverbial bridge and at least understand someone else's point of view, you are expanded. Um, as a person, you are enlightened as a person, and you maybe will find something that you have in common, but you are enriched nonetheless, even if you hate what that person says or hate what that person stands for, you at least know something about who they are as a human being. Wow, that's powerful, very, very powerful. That's important work as well. So um, let me move on, thank you, um, to Jelani Cobb. Um, you've recounted uh, recurrent instances of violence in this country, particularly against young African-American citizens from mm -hmm. which the Black Lives Matter movement came about. Mm -hmm. White supremacists have been targeting college and university campuses with propaganda for decades, and in the past two years we've seen a pretty dramatic increase, a violent increase in white supremacist activity. How do you make sense of this new trend and how do we address it uh, in the context of the mission of our higher education institutions? Um, well, first, I think it's important to say that uh, this is not an aberration. Can you take my, my mic down just a little bit? This is not an aberration. Uh, and as a, as a person who is trained as a historian, uh, it becomes, it's difficult to have this conversation in the current context, the way that we typically have it, that these problems emerged uh, overnight from nowhere. You know, that, you know, what happened on this campus, what happened um, in Oregon, what happened uh, in Charleston, what happened, all these kinds of things that have been kind of um, headline moments are undergirded by an extensive history and in, in a tradition of racial violence in this country. And so uh, on the one hand, I could talk, and I know this from being in the classroom, uh, the number of times that you know, I've taught about lynching, and I've had students, usually white, who have no idea that lynching happened in this country, mm -hmm. and that there was a kind of recreational culture of public homicide in the United States. Now, black students almost always know this. And in some instances, I have people who come up and talk to me about relatives that, that knew um, about these things. Or in one instance, a classmate of mine uh, told me about an, uh, a great uncle of his who was a lynching victim. Uh, and so I think that projects like uh, what Brian Stevenson is doing with the lynching memorial in Montgomery are crucial, but they're the tip of a very big, very ugly um, iceberg in American history. And so once we accept that this violence has been endemic uh, and that the society has built itself uh, upon the tradition of a democracy undergirded by genocide and enslavement, like if those two things can coexist, then I think the, that what we see in the contemporary context begins to make more sense. And so um, the other thing that I think is that it's been you know, this fundamental question in the United States, you know, on that founding creed of we the people, has always been uh, a great deal of discord around who the first person plural was mm -hmm. referring to. Mm -hmm in that phrase. Uh, and so like we have fought wars, literally the most 
uh, profound conflict in, the, in American history in which 700,000 plus people died was essentially about that question of who constitutes we. Uh, and there's almost a kind of clockwork regularity with which uh, people arise. And they, you have to give them credit for being honest when they say that they want to take their country back. You know, it's not coded, it's not uh, any kind of euphemism or anything like that. They literally are saying, no, this was our country. It was meant to be our country. In the uh, analysis of uh, Chief Justice Taney uh, in uh, the Dred Scott decision, he said that from his understanding of what the founders had set out to do, they intended to create a white country, that the first immigration laws in the United States only allowed white people to enter the country and become citizens of the country. There is this argument that this is what American democracy was meant to be. It was meant to be a heron vote democracy, meaning that the rights and um, privileges of belonging to civil society would be restricted to a particular group. And there's the counter argument of an inclusive society, a society that actually uh, believes in the broadest possible definition and connotation of the term we. And we've been fighting and killing each other over that question since the inception of this country. And so I don't think that we should look at that as an aberration, I don't, but I do think that we should be alarmed nonetheless when that kind of violence receives uh, aid and comfort from the most powerful offices and institutions in this country. And of course, I'd be remiss if I would say we didn't have this conversation previously with, with Suzanne um, in Charlottesville talking about just how you know, we find ourselves confronting these same questions again and again and again. All right, thank you. Um, Carolyn Lukensmeyer, there, there's been an awful lot of tension these days about polarization in politics and in media. Um, in a speech you gave last year on the National Mall, you spoke about how social media has bolstered a trend in this country toward demonizing, vilifying, and hating each other. Mm. And that this is happening across the political spectrum, which has become like a virus in this country. Uh, you've said that social media makes us all broadcasters, uh, but you question whether we are really l ever listening to each other. Michelle was just saying. In the wake of the types of violence and death described by Jelani, how do we talk across differences in ways that make sense, in, in ways that do not lend credibility to white supremacist ideologies? How do we teach our students to engage in dialogues across differences in ways that will reduce the cultural divides and advance toward a more unified society? Well, I want to put this in the context of something that we sometimes forget. That actually, we as human beings are social beings. We respond to the context that we're in, to the structure that we're in, and to the signals we get in that structure. And I'm going to also talk for a moment about Charlottesville. To me, the most dramatic example in our shared public life about this reality of context is to contrast Richmond, Virginia, and how that community responded to the issue about memorials, Confederate memorials, and Charlottesville. City fathers and mothers in all sectors, two and a half years ago, watching what had happened in some other communities in the country, began to gather citizens in their neighborhoods to have discussions about what should we do with the monuments. And that only this last May did they end those discussions and come up with a set of recommendations about what the community should do. So, it is no surprise, in contrast, Charlottesville, long before the August horrific events that ended in a murder, had actually had contentious issues in the community, some of which were between the university and the community. And they were not dealt with in a leadership way. They festered. There were a lot of tensions. 
So we should none of us be surprised that the white nationalists who planned that event chose a community where there were some fractures visible. They did not choose a community where there was already leadership of all races, all sectors, saying, we've got to talk this through. If I bring it back to the context of social media, which you were focused on, and I, I recently spoke to 300 college freshmen in a campus in Massachusetts. And I started that, process, that my talk asking students, how many of you have re been, received the brunt of a really negative message on social media? And literally every hand in the room went up. The second question I asked was, how many of you have actually ever sent a message on social media that you know was by definition hurtful or harmful to someone on the receiving end. And frankly, about 75% of the hands went up. We had already created a context in which this was going to be a very authentic conversation. The last question I asked was, how many of you regret that you sent that message and would do something different? And about two-thirds of the hands went up. So I share this. We're in a context in which we know the negative impacts of social media. We know the Im negative impacts they have on us. We even know how we use it sometimes, that by definition is spreading this issue. To me, we need to deal with this on two levels. In fact, everything we're going to talk about tonight, we need to always deal with in two levels. The behavioral aspect, how each one of us behaves, and the systemic structures that have to be changed to actually send a different normative signal. In every other form of major communication, first in print, then in radio, then in television, then the entertainment industries, we have established codes of conduct. We have established standards of what's legitimate in that form of communication and what isn't. And no, they're not perfect, but they have set norms that people sometimes, and a lot more than don't, pay attention to. In this new world of an information ecology that's completely different, we've twinned social media with the notion of the absolute freedom of expression with no constraints. I think something that university campuses particularly can do, there's several groups, and most of them are young people, who are putting forward notions of how to develop a standard of conduct for social media that matches how we want to be treated. And I think this is a moment in time when we need that kind of structure if, in fact, social media will not continue to be so destructive to so many people in so many communities. Great. I'd love to come back to that when we have a chance in this conversation. It sounds fascinating. Um, Suzanne Nossel, uh, with PEN America, you have been uh, touring the country last year, visiting college and university campuses to convene dialogues. Uh, about the tensions between the institutional values of respect, inclusion, equity, diversity, justice, versus, in some ways, free speech and free expression, which seem to be in conflict in many ways um, these days. In your experience, why are college and university campuses so central to these critical challenges? What, what can be done to reduce the perceptions that these fund fundamental values are in opposition? Well. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me here on such a distinguished panel, um, and I'm, I'm really pleased that you're taking the, that conversation we had in Charlottesville uh, forward in this way. So we start our work on campus free speech. Uh, we're a free speech organization, uh, and we became concerned that, that exactly what Roger set out, that the values of diversity, inclusion, and equality in some instances, we're being set against the principles of academic freedom and freedom of expression that have governed at our universities. And it was our 
view that that tension was dangerous and unhealthy and that we had to find a way and try to promote a way of reconciling these principles and putting forward the idea that the campus must do more, much more, to truly reflect the needs of a diverse and increasingly diverse student population, uh, but that it could do so and should do so without compromising robust protections for free speech and academic freedom. So that we have to find a way for these two sets of, you know, in my view, liberal values to coexist. Not that it's always easy, but we analyzed a whole series of events that had taken place, um, controversies at the University of Missouri, at Yale, you know, that really pitted these values, these sets of values against one another or seemed to. And what we, we started off with a report where we really tried to let, give both sides their due. So we looked at things like microaggressions, disinvitations of speakers, the argument over safe spaces, and really laid out on the one side, you know, what is the case for safe space? I mean, you use the word, Michelle, safe space. It's, it, this is not a, you know, people caricature it as a uh, plea to uh, coddle our youth, uh, you know, to, to shelter them, you know, sort of a cushioned space with Play-Doh. You know, it's not really that. It's really about having a university environment where everybody feels some sense of belonging. They're kind of comfortable enough to be able to take some risks. They feel like they have a place on campus, that their, their presence there is not being questioned as they walk across the quad. They're not being asked to produce an ID or being shaken awake when they take a nap in a common room and asked, you know, what are you doing here? You know, that's, that's you know, one concept of safe space. Um, but at the same time, you know, what's the other side? The other side, uh, uh, what's the other side of the argument? You know, there are genuine concerns that if the classroom is a safe space, that if talking about controversial ideas, debating something like affirmative action uh, or immigration, you know, which are, they're tough ideas. And for some people, they may hit very hard or uh, issues of sexual assault or rape culture. You know, they're discussion topics that, you know, really do make some people very uncomfortable. And yet, if we foreclose those from happening in our classroom, we're cutting off whole areas of study inquiry, discussion, and debate that are important and essential for our society. So our effort has really been to try to explain and set out how these sets of principles can coexist, not perfectly, but you know, you know, with a set of principles and guidelines to help administrators, faculty, and students navigate these controversies in ways that respect what students are asking for, what the press is for greater uh, social and racial justice on campus, and the imperative of that but also uh, keeping the campus open to all ideas. And you know, to me, why, you know, why is it important to do this work on campus? I mean, this is, to me, is the rising generation. And it's really, I think there are a lot of students, or at least young people here in the audience, like ultimately you're gonna decide you know, how we weigh these things up, you know, whether we create sets of rules that take to certain topics you know, effectively off limits from discussion. And I think you know, that's happening in some ways. That, you know, let's face it, there are some subjects and ideas that provoke such an incendiary reaction that I think all of us are a little bit afraid to kind of go there because if you're, you know, if you do, you know, you know, know what you might get back. You may get trolled online. There are reprisals. They may not be from our government, but there, there are other kind of harsh and stigmatizing reprisals that can come from voicing certain opinions. And, you know, in some cases I think it's appropriate. It's taboos that we want to have as a society. In other instances, I think we're at risk of shutting down discussions, debate, and even research that should have a place uh, and, and an opportunity to go forward. So you know, that's our interest, really, is fostering this dialogue on, on the campus so that we come up with solutions that can enable these imp very important values that we think fundamentally are compatible to kind of coexist and that a, a rising generation finds a way so that we can, for us to do that so that this tension eventually eases. Let me ask a follow-up question to you that relates to something that Carolyn said, which is, you know, Carolyn was talking about the idea of standards for social media, um, to try and develop some ways to think about how can we, you know, sort of curb some of the, the, the weaponization of social media, right? What, what are your thoughts about that? Is that is is social media really an absolute free speech platform, and should it remain that way? Are there standards that can be created? Yeah, I mean it's a good question, and you know we are also concerned with 
what we see is the, the shutting down of speech on social media. We've done a whole, uh, we call it a field manual on online harassment, and it's geared toward writers and journalists, but it's really for anybody who is experiencing online harassment because we're worried about people, and it's, for the most part, women who are retreating, getting off social media, including journalists who, for whom it's part of their livelihood. It's how, part of how they build their reputation, how they get their stories out. But the vitriol and harassment and negativity and threats and doxing that they encounter is incredibly intimidating. And so people retreat, and that's silencing. And for us, that's a threat to free expression. So I don't think it's as simple as it should be a free-for-all. At the same time, you know, I think it really depends how these standards are imposed and how they're policed. You know, there's been a whole campaign by another organization, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, against speech codes on campus. And they've, you know, they document which universities have such codes. And you know, those codes, I, you know, which are more restrictive than the First Amendment, they bar uh, types of speech, categories of speech that are protected on the first, under the First Amendment, you know, with the idea that you know, the campuses can be sort of a narrower sphere for speech. And I think that, you know, there's real risk to that, because there are ideas that are simultaneously offensive, but also worth debating. And I think if we try to cleanse and expunge our campus from those ideas entirely, we're not preparing for people for what they'll encounter in the rest of the world. You know, we run the risk of drawing those lines uh, in, in such a way that legitimate perspectives, I mean, let's say the advocacy of violence, where we could all say, you know, that's terrible, but what if you're talking about the rebels in Syria and they advocate violence? You know, is that, you know, equally as outrageous? You know, I, I, my uh, phrase I've used is, you know, what if um, Twitter's terrorist is Facebook's freedom fighter? Like these conflicts and positions can look very different depending on the lens. So I think we have to be very careful. And my preference is for kind of uh, approaching it in a community-oriented way where it's not a matter of administrators, much less the government, policing such standards and, and punishing and prohibiting speech. Great. Jelani, what, what are your thoughts about some of this? I, I want to bring you into that part of the conversation about on university campuses, thinking about what is free speech, what's fair game, we're marketplaces of ideas in institutions of higher education, but are there limits? I mean, aside from incitement or threats or intimidation, um, clear stop challenges there. to safety? <laughs> no, no, you can stop there, literally, because we said aside from incitement or threats or harassment or intimidation. So that marketplace that we're just talking about, this marketplace of ideas, is not a deregulated marketplace. There are regulations in place already. Um, and you know, we can't, employers have the capacity to uh, determine how their employees communicate what they say uh, during their work, in their workplace. And so um, what, and it's Suzanne and I have this conversation I like, what is it, like weekly <laughs> at this point? <laughs> we go back and forth on this a lot. Um, and so what happens is this. The question simply becomes, what aspects of that marketplace uh, is it OK to regulate? So you can't slander someone. Um, we have libel laws. Of course, the president famously wants to open up the libel laws, whatever that means. Um, you know, we have uh, laws about incitement, which is weird when we think about it. That is a very, very weird um, uh, policy around the idea of incitement because incitement is typically an individual urging a crowd to do something that, that we believe to be harmful, nefarious, whatever it is. But if we believe in a marketplace, the whole principle of a marketplace is to say that generally, in a marketplace, people can make rational decisions for themselves. So if I throw up a, uh, an idea and say, hey, let's all turn over the chairs in this room and, I don't know, smash the windows. Please don't do that. <laughs> but no one was, gonna, was going to do that anyway. Everyone was still remaining in their seats. And if I were to run and grab a chair, aside from not being invited back to University of Maryland, <laughs> <laughs> and then being like or vilified. possibly being arrested. <laughs> being arrested, vilified, and ridiculed, uh, the dean at my job being like, well, explain to us how you got the chair in your hand. Um, aside from something like that happening, that would be the end of it. 
But the principle of incitement is that we have to protect people from the persuasive power of one individual over the consciences of 30 people, or 50 people, or 100 people. So it proves that we don't believe that this marketplace of ideas is infallible. That there is some manner by which it has to be regulated. But we don't want to regulate it as it comes to issues of race. We don't want, we, we say for people to just toughen up. We don't want to regulate it as it comes to people uh, articulating uh, the dynamics of rape culture on their campuses. We say that they should just toughen up. We don't want to regulate it, and particularly the people who have suffered most egregiously from the failures of American democracy. Anything relating to them, right. oh no, we want them to just toughen up and it has to be a, a free and open marketplace for conversation. And so that is like the inherently contradictory part of it. And the last thing that I'll say about that is that I believe in debate. I don't believe in debate for debate's sake. Mm -hmm. uh, and so on my own campus, uh, the campus Republicans brought Charles Murray. Um, and created this big, you know, issue and, you know, was allegedly around the issue of free speech, but it doesn't diminish a university as a marketplace of ideas to say that we will no longer traffic in an idea race that has been th so thoroughly disproven by anthropologists, biologists, uh, every kind of arena we want to talk about intellectual uh, inquiry, but yet we still have people who are still uh, allowed to provocatively make arguments around race on college campuses and grant them the distinction and the imprimatur of the prestige of these institutions. Mm -hmm. We do not invite phrenologists <laughs> to psychology departments. We do not invite alchemists to chemistry departments. We have ideas that we say we don't invite Malthusian uh, economists to our economics departments, because we believe those are dead ideas. But somehow or another, this one idea, it's, um, what is that character, the one that's always says, Jason, the one that you, you kill him and he comes back, you know, it's like, it's like the horror flick. Freddy Krueger. Like Freddy Krueger. It's like uh, supernatural. It's like, oh, we thought we killed race. Franz Boas thought he killed race in 1913. The joke, joke was on him. So what do we talk about? Though. I mean, you, your answer to my question, Michelle, was people want to talk about race. And there, I think in, in some ways in a higher education setting, there are some real tensions around talking about race in the classroom. Um, in my work, in, as part of the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center, we, we want to help faculty develop those skills to talk about controversial subject matters in classrooms. But we found that oftentimes faculty are afraid. Well, first of all, I like the fact that you use the word skill because it actually is a skill. And it's a skill that is not often recognized as such. Um, and you noted that there's real peril associated with this. That's not made up. You know, it, if to have conversations around some of these issues is like walking through a minefield and there are real, there is real associated peril. So if you say the wrong thing, you can lose status, you can actually lose a job. So that does account for some of the trepidation around this issue. But it's interesting that we're talking about college campuses and social media at the same time because there's less trepidation in social media. Um, people will say all kinds of things under the, you know, they'll, and, and then it'd be followed with the hashtag just saying. Mm -hmm. right, right. Just keeping it real. Right. Um, but they will not necessarily say that to you, to your face. Mm -hmm. They will not necessarily say that to you at the table in the student union or in the college dormitory. So how do you create a space where people can actually talk to each other and hear each other? That's a skill. That's an actual skill. And it's a difficult skill to um, acquire at a moment, I think, and to practice that skill at a moment where we have people in, in high places who are actually invested in our division. And just think about that for a minute. Invested in our division. People who we assume would normally be trying to yoke the country together are actually invested in the community and individual communities, but the community writ large, America, being divided right now. So how do you, how do you actually do that? Um, you figure out how to do that um, through curriculum. You figure out how to do that through practice. You figure out how to do that by bringing people together. You figure out how to do that through extensions of grace. And that may sound soft, 
but to figure out how to bring people together and recognize that they're not going to agree. Because oftentimes the skill set is built around the idea that we're going to come together and we're going to reach the term. The term is often used common ground. I don't like that term. I don't use it in the work that I do because I don't think we're likely to always find common ground. There may be a Venn diagram where we have some things in common, but through the work that we do at the bridge, we talk about bridge building and the, the importance of tension. If you're actually trying to build a bridge, Jelani and I are having an argument and I want to cross the bridge to understand what he's saying. I need to cross a bridge that only stands because there's opposing forces. There's tensile strength that actually holds that bridge together and recognizing that sometimes there's some benefit in recognizing the division and recognizing that we're not actually going to bring everybody together. But building those skills is, are very important because for the young people in this room, recognize that when you go out and you try to get a job, employees are looking for those skills. They're actually looking for people who can lead units, lead companies, you know, lead to work in management operations where they actually know how to manage difficult dialogue. They know how to bring people together across a lot of backgrounds and experiences and figure out how they can row together effectively even when they don't agree. And that's a skill that's recognized outside of these walls, so we have to figure out how it's better recognized, supported, um, and appreciated within these walls. These walls, good. Carolyn, you wanted to jump in. Well, folks may not know, but the National Institute for Civil Discourse was actually created after the mass shooting in Tucson, Arizona, when six people were killed and 13 were wounded, including Representative Gabby Giffords. Mm -hmm. Gabby Giffords was in the state legislature before she came mm -hmm. to DC, and she was widely loved and respected way across the ideological spectrum. And the university came together with the community 10 days after the memorial service to say, we have to make something good come out of this horrific tragedy. So the whole reason d'etre for our institute is to do exactly what Michelle was talking about, is to actually create safe spaces, or whatever else you want to call it, where people can come together and talk and listen, and the critical thing is listen, across the divide, whether that divide is whether or not we should build a wall, or whether that divide is you voted for Hillary and I voted for Trump, or whatever the divide is. The good news, and I'm only going to repeat, Michelle said this about race, but people in this country really know how wrong where we are today is. 75% of Americans say that the incivility that we are now doing with each other, not just the politicians in Washington, is a crisis in the country. And people are eager to be in these connections. But in many communities, there's not the space or the organizations or the leadership to actually create the opportunities for that. So I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. And then I'm go to a website, www revivecivility.org. It is full of tools about how to do this in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, how to do this in a small group conversation, how to do this in a community meeting of four or five hundred people, and how to do it on a texting platform. Take your phones. You can take them out right now if you want to. Text the number 89800 and text the word civility to that number. And it takes you to a back-end computer program that is essentially a script. And the phone becomes the facilitator of a conversation about how, even though I voted for Trump and you voted for Hillary or vice versa, how could we actually have a conversation that the whole purpose, the entire purpose of that conversation is to actually come to a place where I've listened long enough to you that I understand how your life experience led you to see that as a legitimate choice, or led you to believe we should build a wall. And then you listen to me long enough where you can tell why I really hate the idea of a wall. And I'm even going to. Think of a time when you're in a conversation. Let's say we're doing this one-on-one. -on -one. We start out, and we're really doing a good job. 
But all of a sudden, you say something that I just, I can't, I want to, and you, you have a whole physiological reaction. Some people's faces flush, everybody's breath, breathing changes. If you really want to do this in terms of understanding how I came to this position, two things to do at that moment when you want a small word attack back. First of all, take a breath. Literally, physiologically, taking a breath reshifts your interiority. And the second is ask a question. I'm going to give you a source. Google unlikely friendship. It will take you to a four minute and 40 second video of Donna Redwing, Iowa's most prominent gay activist, and Bob Vanderplatt, who was Ted Cruz's policy advisor in his 2016 presidential campaign. There are not two human beings on the planet further apart in what they think about gayness what they think about the public policy should be in terms of gay rights. But they both got sick of the hatred in terms of the advocacy that was happening in the state of Iowa about gay marriage. They agree to meet for coffee. Just watch the video and you'll see two people actually accomplish what I was just suggesting. At the Institute, we use that video in training members of state legislatures. We've now worked in 16 states, over 750 members, Republicans, Democrats, occasional independents, libertarians, where literally, after going through this experience of stopping seeing each other, you're the liberal Democrat and I'm the conservative Republican, of getting back to the place, the fundamental thing is seeing each other as people, seeing each other as human beings. And you don't need to call it common ground, but what you discover is we all have, underneath all this crap, a lot of shared values about what we want for a quality of life. And it's not Pollyannish. There isn't, yes, the conflicts are going to exist in other places, but at the Institute, we get thousands of messages. My family can't talk. My place of faith can't talk. Biggest surprise to me? We could call some major corporations where product innovation teams haven't come back to the same level of productivity post-election. That was two years ago. We're getting those calls also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add something, if I can, because the word has come up twice now, safe space. Mm -hmm. I want to share something that we learned in the work that we do. I actually said people are looking for a safe and a brave space. And I never say one without the other. Because my job is not to make you feel good about race. Yep. That is not my job, to inoculate you, to make you walk out of the room and feel like we're in a better place if we're not. My job is to help you to find courage and to step into a space of bravery where you can speak your truth and where you can stay at the table when someone else speaks theirs. And so I just wanted to offer that mm -hmm. because I think what you're talking about is actually, is, is, is not just safety. It's not just finding, it's, true. it's, it's, true. it's finding a, a brave space where you're actually willing to engage with someone. Um, and a brave space where, to honor what Jelani said, where you're also willing to look over your shoulder and understand the hard truths in this country. Because unless you're willing to do that, you will never fully understand where we're at today, how we got here, and how we can ever think about moving forward. Some really important themes that have surfaced, the idea of listening. Um, that, that oftentimes when people think about having difficult dialogues, they think about what they're going to say, not what they're going to hear, or how they're going to integrate what they're listening to. Um, and, and in social media, how that is particularly a challenge because it's you know, often viewed as a one-way kind of vehicle. Uh, and, then, and, and we get into these situations, I think, in college and university campuses where we find situations oftentimes where people aren't interested in listeners so much, and that's part of Jelani, you were kind of talking about that a little bit, right? When people dehumanizing, and, and part of what you said, Carolyn, was the idea that we need to think of the other as a human being, and sometimes, you know, there are folks here on our campus who don't believe those things are true. 
how do we deal with those folks who don't want to listen and aren't interested in this marketplace of ideas, this humanization of people? I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure I agree. Ooh. Did I do that? Well, I'm not sure I agree. Um, I mean, I think that there, I don't think that uh, all constituent parts are created equal in this impasse. Um, and so it, to understand the tenacity and the endurance, the durability of the problems that we have in this society, we could look at it as a product of not understanding or uh, people failing to recognize each, each other's humanity, or to say that these systems were really well engineered to do exactly what they've mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. I agree. Say that again. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's part that, of it. Say that for the folks right. in the because, back. Because, that's... right, like, segregationists knew what they were doing. It wasn't. And like all the dialogue in the world wasn't going to change something that was in their interests. And so you can have dialogue, and I think that that's why countries have diplomacy. And I also think that countries sometimes break off diplomatic relations when they recognize that there's no um, viability in further dialogue. Now, breaking off relations, diplomatic relations, is always the last step. But I do think that for the circumstances we find ourselves in in this country, we didn't get here accidentally. I also Agreed. don't think that it's like incumbent upon me to explain my humanity to you. Because I don't have the problem of recognizing you as a human being. Like it's not a kind of even um, thing. We're going like, wow, you know, I talk with this like, Trump voter, and I realized that he was a human being. I, I don't, that wasn't on the table for me. Um, I think that, that you're very likely to be a racist human being. And what I mean by that, and before people like freak out, is that when people, uh, and, and many of our colleagues uh, had this issue of reacting immediately when people were saying that Trump, that Trump's racism was appealing to his voters. And then we got the economic anxiety cliche, cliche. And you know, I went to some of those rallies, and you know, the behavior I saw there was not economic. There was something <laughs> else happening. Like I went with one of my friends uh, to a rally in North Carolina, and he said, "I'm getting out of here because it reminds me of those pictures of lynchings, the crowds from you know the pictures of lynchings." Uh, and so, study after study after study has found that racial anxiety drove people to Trump. That it wasn't the economy. It also it wouldn't explain why the higher you went in the economic strata, the better Trump did with white people. He did best with white people who made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and he broke even with Hillary Clinton with, I think, white voters who were under $20,000 a year. So it wasn't simply economic. Yeah. And so I think that people understand their interests in particular ways. I, my interest is in democracy, and you believe your interest is in denying me access to it. And so dialogue has its utilities, but I don't think that we should believe that in and of itself is going to get us to where we need to be. I couldn't I agree more. Remember I said that I think we have to deal with this behaviorally and systemically. Mm -hmm. And I was only dealing with, there are people in the country who are ready to deal with this at that level. And there are ways to do that well. But that does not in any way let us off the hook from dealing with the systemic issues that are still rampant in our justice system, in our education system. Mm -hmm. We can do with both. Yeah, just two, two points. I mean, one phenomenon that I've observed is that uh, I think as hatred has been unleashed in society writ large, and at a time when we can no longer rely on our top leaders to step in the way they did, you know, when a pastor wanted to burn the Quran in Florida, and it was on the verge of you know, triggering this huge international incident and violence, in fact, had done so, you know, we had the Secretary of State, we had the Secretary of Defense, you know, speaking up 
against this kind of, uh, you know, hateful behavior, saying, look, it's protected by the First Amendment, but we, uh, you know, we, you know, we despise this, we loathe this, uh, you know, we, we absolutely reject this. And, you know, that kind of leadership right now is, uh, you know, it's worse than absent. We have the opposite. And I think the impulse, which I completely understand, is, you know, as hatred is unleashed in society at large, we've kind of become a little more assertive in policing the small realms that we can police, whether it's a campus or a magazine or, uh, you know, the New York Review of Books, uh, you know, we feel we, we're, we're a little less tolerant of the breadth of opinion than we might once have been because we feel, uh, you know, we need these, these enclaves to be zones where, you know, certain values prevail as it feels like they're under assault and under retreat in society writ large. On the, this question of kind of, I think of it as sort of a question of civility versus confrontation. And, you know, to me it brings to mind, you know, these encounters in restaurants and this debate over whether, you know, officials of the administration ought to be able to have dinner in peace. And it's, it's an interesting debate because people, what I've Great. observed is that, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't break down by strict kind of uh, party lines or progressive lines. You know, people have different personal reactions to it. And, you know, my feeling is we need both. We need people like Carolyn, you know, out there as, you know, uh, energetically as she is and can be with her center to get legislators who are willing to sit around a table, meet each other, get to know each other, get past their biases to do that. But we also need people, frankly, out on the streets. Absolutely. You know, at, you know saying, forget it. You know, you're not going to call my humanity into question. We absolutely reject this. I'm going to confront you in an elevator and tell you, you know, what my life has, experience has been and put it in your face. You know, I don't Great. think they're mutually exclusive. I think we each have our role to play in moments like this, and it, you know, it really, it's, it's a question of your own values, where you think you can make a difference, what your comfort level is, but we absolutely need both. We don't know how we're getting through this. You know, we don't yep. know, God willing, this ends. We don't know how it ends. And I think both of these sets of tactics are gonna play their role. Agreed. You know, one, if, one thing that was interesting, when I first took this leadership here, I was, this was before civility became such a big topic in society. And no matter who I was talking to, academics or legislators or the public, there was always a lot of pushback of, aren't, isn't civility you're just telling me to be nice? Mm. Aren't you just mm. saying you should behave, manners? And it is interesting, in Western society, that is what the word of civility has kind of evolved into. So I actually looked up the etiology of the word, and it turns out civility came from a French word in the 1300s that actually means the duties or responsibilities of a citizen, which is a very, very different take on what civility mm -hmm. actually means in terms of what we need to do as normative social values in a democracy. So how do, how do students enact civility when they are encountering conditions on college and university campuses that are wholly unacceptable. How do students who are um, walking down the street and encounter a racial epithet yelled out of a vehicle passing by? How do students uh, who encounter a swastika uh, posted on their whiteboards in their residence halls uh, engage in civility um, in, the, in those contexts? And, and how do we as an institution find ways to both address those issues when they occur, but also create the kind of learning environment that is fundamental to our mission? But I think I'm with Jelani here because we're, 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 we're talking about two different things. If you're yeah. talking about someone painting a swastika on a wall, that is a hate crime. Mm. Yep, absolutely. So that, that, you know, to call for civility in the face of that is unreasonable. Um, and, and I think that anyone who would encounter that should follow, you know, they should expect due process and protection and justice under the law. I would not expect that someone who encountered that thinks, how can I be civil to the person who just painted a swastika on my, my dorm room wall? Um, that, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's even a conversation that we should engage in. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I think the epithet yelled out of the car is a particularly interesting um, one um, because after 
like lots of study and I've examined this question um, and gone into archives and, and researched it and uh, the best response is your mother. Um, and so. <laughs> Right? No, I'm being facetious. <laughs> it's actually your father. Um, is that is that what would come out on the text, Carolyn? <laughs> uh, no, like, but, but I, I think that <laughs> I think that um, there's an interesting dynamic about this uh, in terms of um, you know who the weight falls upon to be civil. And I know that because um, I'm a six or three inch black man. Mm -hmm. And that my life is mediated by whether or not the people around me, very often the white people around me, are nervous. Because if they're nervous, that means I'm not safe. Um, or if I'm intimidating, like these are just things that I have to know mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. And so we're asking an additional burden of people to say that in addition to dealing with uh, the gravity of these situations, we're also uh, adding a tax, which is to say that you have to respond in ways that people deem socially appropriate. And I think that that's unfair. Now, I'll appear to contradict myself here. I think it's unfair, but I think it is wise. Because the ultimate objective, I think, and when I talk with students, we go through all the kind of twists and turns and convoluted um, avenues, and then I come back to, but yeah, it does, it does basically come down to toughen up. And the reason that I say that is that I'm very skeptical about the likelihood of people who set out to troll you, of people who set out to throw you off your game, or people who don't believe that you belong at the university. I'm very skeptical about what happens if you let those people know that they got to you. Yep. It only engenders more. And it's unfair, it's unjust, it shouldn't be asked of you, and that's the world that we live in. And so, um, you know, I always go back to this eventually. At some point, my father was a boxer, uh, and he said, the punch that hits you is the one that, the, the, the punch that hurts you is the one that they're going to throw again. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's just a pragmatic sensibility around these things that it may not be, uh, and that goes back to the point of safe space, like safe space is the place where you can actually let down your guard, uh, where you don't have to anticipate that this is gonna be um, a kind of battle for the integrity of your psyche in, in this particular environment. Can I introduce can I? attention though? Mm -hmm. Because I, 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 your father and my mother would have gotten along, my mother was not a boxer but she could she still can throw a punch. <laughs> Eighty something years old. I can't get up, but if you get close, um, she sent me to college with a piece of paper with a handwritten note that said, "No one can make you feel inferior without your con consent." Mm -hmm. Quoting Eleanor mm -hmm. Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. um, and so I understand the, the toughen up notion that you just muscle through it. But I also, again, I come back to the power of, of narrative. Mm -hmm. You also have to tell your story. So suffering in silence, you know, does no one any good. I, I'm thinking about, I, I read the article in, um, in the Women's Issue of New York Magazine, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of, of what Anita Hill said in particular. Yeah. People always tell her that she lost, and she says, no, I didn't lose, I told my story, and therefore many people know what I went through, and more people are empowered to tell theirs. So, you know, when someone yells at you and you feel like you have to tunnel through and you don't want them to know that they landed a punch, so they come and, and, and punch you again in that same spot, um, it is important that you do tell that story and that, you, that the university, that the community understands um, that you're not in a safe space if this kind of thing is happening to you. Um, and so I, I don't want um, suffer in silence to, I don't want mm -hmm. you to focus too much on the suffering and I certainly don't want you to focus on the silence because Just your voice is important. I agree. I think yep. it also comes well back to Carol and one of the you made at the very beginning, you know, there's the individual level and the systemic level. So, when something like that, an incident like that happens, there's, you know, Jelani's addressing, well, what does the individual do? And, and, and Michelle, but there's also the institutional response. Right. And this yep. is something we've put a lot of stress on, that the university, you know, has a dual role. Yes, it's, uh, it, you know, in our view, has to be, it should be an open platform for a great diversity of ideas to be 
debated and to be able to be voiced on campus, but it also is an uh, institution that embodies certain values. So the university has to speak out, and I think it's, it's the failure of universities to speak out forcefully about the, ri you know, the persistence of racism, the rise of hate speech, you know, the experience of uh, students who don't, aren't, aren't fully uh, equipped and enabled to participate uh, on an equal basis with others. It's that failure that really, you know, sparks, I think, uh, you know, some of the most, in my view, kind of counterproductive responses. That, you know, that's when students really feel like they have no choice but to get violent to shut it down. If the university is speaking out, you know, someone, Milo Yiannopoulos or Richard Spencer comes to campus, uh, but the university is unequivocal. Some have been in rejecting the message, uh, ensuring that counter protests can go forward, you know, asserting the university's values in a very clear way and mobilizing around that, you know, then the campus can tolerate it. It's where they, you know, in some cases even inadvertently give the imprimatur uh, to some of these speeches. You know, there's an instance, one instance with Charles Murray where I think the problem really was that the university president had a habit, a practice of introducing every speaker who came to that small campus and did it in the case of Charles Murray. And so even though you know, it was the politics department or the college Republicans that had invited to, uh, them, the university's uh, president's presence introducing that speech gave it a completely different cast and I think sparked a lot of the outrage that erupted. You know, Suzanne, you, you, the, 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 the failure of leadership here, hmm. their silence or not really understanding that you might have to pivot or you might have to approach a speech by Charles Murray a little bit differently, I think also reflects a fact of leadership in America that a lot of people who hold leadership positions in America hold those positions because they have effectively managed not to deal with race. Yep. And if you want to sit in the corner office, if you want to rise to you know, the highest position in your company, you are highly incentivized to avoid this issue altogether. And so the first time that you encounter it is often in a moment of crisis. So you aren't developing the skills that we talked about so that you actually know how to handle the large issues or the small issues or really any issue at all because you've given this issue and what, what my kids call the full Heisman. You know, like, <laughs> I am not touching that. Um, and, and therefore you're in leadership and you don't have this critical scope. I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. And to, to put a kind of concrete example to this, uh, I, after the, the Times did the neo-Nazi next door piece mm -hmm. that you know, everybody mm -hmm. lost their minds over, I had a conversation, I had lunch with an editor at the Times, and uh, you know, this person wanted to understand why the Times was being beaten up so much for their, um, their coverage. And this is like in the first year of that, this, the current administration. And I said to him that really, the sirens that are going off for people who are in vulnerable communities like we're hearing alarms and you're hearing like a distant faint, like, hmm, what is that? Is that something I hear? Yeah. You know, and so while we're a, like fully in a defensive posture and saying that things that, we, that are tangible within our history are beginning to repeat themselves, mm -hmm. because you don't have that history or that rec the recognition or maybe that visceral connection to it, you can have a neo-Nazi piece that is a, um, you know, human interest level story. Mm -hmm. And so this person rises, very many people in these institutions have risen. Um, Harvard invited uh, Sean Spicer uh, and I right. think it was Corey Lewandowski. Right. There is no barrier beyond which people are excluded. And so it's because you have not fully addressed or fully uh, digested what exactly has really happened in this country. And you're not alarmed by that. So a theme that's kind of begun in my head, and I don't know if I can do a good job of this, but we have, I want to, I think it's part of this balance between behavior and systemic. You know, Donald Trump became the president because of a set of failures in our electoral system over many decades. Too much money in politics. No, I mean, we could all go through those structural issues that have brought us to this place in our political life. And yet, I think underlying everything we've talked about tonight is how are all of us in this country at this moment in time 
going to view our actions and our responsibility in the way the system gives us the opportunity to do that to actually be sure that we are engaging in literally how our democracy works. You know what, we're three weeks from a midterm election. Yesterday morning's Washington Post talked about 21 million people in the United States have been unregistered since 2016. George is the state that's getting the most and obvious, just egregious abuse of power. But a sad statement that is an issue and could be dealt with differently on university campuses. But, but what about the two out of 10 millennials who don't register to vote? Well, that's what I was going to say. You, you just took to my statement, mm -hmm. which is, and, I, and I'm someone, my view of this is not blaming millennials for having chosen to leave the arena. For every, literally since the 80s, both mass media and politicians of both parties have run against the government in this country. So you're, you're talking about people in my generation, we saw public service as one of the highest forms of contribution. But most of you have grown up in a time when the government didn't function, couldn't actually pass a budget, in which it's denigrated constantly. But now's a moment when you have to make a choice. Are you actually going to stay out of the fundamental processes and leave the power with people who don't carry the values that you carry. Great I, I actually, I just want to say one thing yes, though, sir. because we live in Washington, we live just on, we live on, you, you study on the lip of Washington, D.C. Government actually does work pretty well. Yeah. And, and it gets a bad rap. Um, there's a new book out, I don't know if any of you have read it, The Fifth the Risk thing. by the Michael. The Fifth Risk. The Fifth yes. Risk. When you read this book, you recognize that the people who go to work every day for the U.S. government, they do it not because they're trying to enrich themselves. They do it because they do it out of service. They do it very well. They protect all of us. And it's important to remember that the government gets a bad rap. It's also too important to remember, I'm sorry if I'm stepping on a bit of a, of a soapbox here, but democracy is not a spectator sport. All of you have a role to play in it. I happen to come from a, a, a line of people who fought and died for my right to vote. So I never miss a day of voting because I know that just two generations ago, uh, just one generation ago, my father came back from the military and was not allowed to vote even though he fought for democracy overseas. So I encourage you, I don't care who you vote for, vote. How Register many? to vote and, 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 and understand that, that if, you're, if you complain about democracy and you don't participate in it, it's a little bit like trying to lose weight by watching somebody else exercise. <laughs> Great transition. I'm going to ask two questions all at the same time. You ready? How many of you are registered to vote? Are there any questions oh. in the audience? Oh, look at all these questions. <laughs> so we do, have, we do have just a couple of minutes left. And so I want to, there are two microphones in the aisles here and here. And I want to give a quick opportunity for anybody with a question to step to the microphone. And you. Is it on? Testing, 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 there testing. You go. There we go. It's on. Good evening. You always make me ask a question. Um, so I was listening to, I think it was Daniel Kahneman on NPR talking about how um, he's the thinking fast and slow person, if you don't remember. People don't really care what the data says. Like it's it's more about the people the people you trust. Um, and if people are to be convinced to do the right thing, or if it's an institution, for instance, it's more about like hearing like your pastor say it or your best friend. But often the pastor and the best friend or the campus leader, like you're saying, is, is afraid to lose just that little bit of social status with you. So it's like your, your allyship is costing you so if you are like a friend in the audience who's hearing another friend say something that's so biased and awful, it's, it's really difficult to say, you know, I love you, but don't say that around me. I'm not okay with that. Like, how do you, have you had a moment like that where it changed your mind? Has it, have you been able to convince people or, or how do we 
spend that social cur currency, I guess. Anybody in particular or the whole panel? Anybody. Whoever, whoever feels lit. Actually, what Mich Michelle said earlier, I think it is an issue of being brave. It's an issue of being courageous. It's an issue of making a choice <laughs> that I really know that what you have just said is not okay. And I think you did it beautifully at the mic. You don't have to demean that person. You don't have to judge that person. But you really have to share with them in your relationship. It's not OK. Yeah, I mean, I, it brings to mind this conversation I overheard recently between um, a teenager and uh, a person in their early 50s. And it was about the N word and whether there was any setting, like a pedagogical setting, in which you could say the word out loud and that, you know, not using it as an epithet, but referring to, you know, let's say its role in history or literature. And the older person was insistent that you, you, you had to make this uh, distinction between use and mention, and that to mention in certain settings, you know, was just fine. And the younger person was adamant that uh, it, it, it's, it's categorical and uh, that they didn't want to hear it. And I think what they did effectively was uh, they said, don't, don't say it around me. You know, I, I, I'm just asking you not to say it around me because I personally find it offensive. That was a, a, a good place to land, I guess, for them. But, and it's interesting, it's a young person because it's usually the opposite, that the young people are, are making the opposite argument. But one thing that you can do, a journalistic trick, is to ask someone to repeat what they said. Hmm. You know, and maybe in a way like, I'm not sure I heard you. Could you just say that again? And when you ask someone to repeat it again, the filters that might not have engaged the first time become more finely meshed. And they have to think about the words in a different way. And when that happens, then there is a space for you to actually have that conversation. Try again. There you go. It's on. It's on. Try it. So the conversation that you're having today is a conversation that has been framed by many as free and open, free and open speech uh, versus oppressive speech. And as I've had this conversation with colleagues and students, I've been often surprised at a philosophical take that Karl Popper posed 73 years ago. And so I'm going to read the paradox of tolerance that I know the panelists know about. But since we are an educational institution, I think it's important for the students to hear this paradox because it encapsulates the conversation that we're having today. So this is what Karl, Pop Karl Popper said in 1945 in the paradox of tolerance. If we extend unlimited tolerance, even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance with them. In this formulation, I do not imply, Karl Popper speaking, for instance, that we should always suppress the utterance of intolerant philosophies as long as we can counter them by rational argument and keep them in check by public opinion, suppression would certainly be unwise. But we should claim the right to suppress them if necessary, even by force, Karl Popper speaking, for it may easily turn out that they are not prepared to meet us on the level of rational argument, but begin by denouncing all argument. They may forbid their followers to listen to rational argument because it is deceptive and teach them to answer arguments by the use of their fists or pistols, Charlottesville. Therefore, we should therefore claim in the name of tolerance the right not to tolerate the intolerant. Yeah, that, that's um, a kind of parallel uh, to the, the idea that democracy can destroy itself democratically. 
And uh, you know, people always talk about the famous uh, you know, Germany 1933 example that, uh, that Hitler was elected. Um, but I think that there's also a kind of more kind of direct, in con the many more co direct and concrete examples. But uh, on that same subject, you know, the federal, United States federal government still has sedition laws on the books mm -hmm. for that very reason. Um, and they're typically saying that in times of war, uh, you know, we don't want you to have to be burdened with the intellectual w uh, weight of uh, debating whether you want to be siding with the Nazis or siding with uh, the uh, United States government. And so we'll just uh, do you the favor of not allowing you to hear enemy propaganda. Uh, this goes back again to the question of like how regulated that marketplace is. Uh, and then you know, going back to Charlottesville for a minute, one of the things that was frustrating leading up to Charlottesville was the fact that so many people were saying this should not happen. And the people who were saying that it should happen were defending it in the name of democracy and, I was, and, and free speech. And I was saying these people are not interested in free speech and they're not interested in democracy. They are actively interested in uprooting any, as a matter of fact, they're reacting to the fact that there was enough democracy for a black man to be elected president. Uh, and so for them, that is their determination that there is too much democracy in the society. Uh, and so predictably, when people gathered and the ACLU defended their right to gather, uh, and then someone was killed and they had to kind of go back to the drawing board and debate what they were going to do. And they came up with a solution that was probably eased their conscience, but it's completely untenable, which is that they would continue to advocate for free speech and defend the right for uh, people to gather in the name of free speech, um, but not people who were armed. I was like, oh, so you're saying that your First and Second Amendment rights can't be exercised simultaneously. <laughs> it was like, or we could go to option B and say that we actually have to recognize. And I don't think that this is, I don't think that we should put out a book about what you can't say. I think that we should just have some recognition that there are some things that do not have any redeeming social value and that those uh, ideas can become weaponized in particular ways. And there are other Western democratic societies uh, you know, in, in France, uh, in Germany, in Canada, who all have this kind of understanding of free speech, that free speech is not threatened um, by the idea of saying that there are some things that are out, out of bounds. Wow. All right, I'm gonna try and get two more questions in, but I wanna comment on what you just said. I think you gave a definition of weaponized speech exercising your First and Second Amendment rights simultaneously. Yes. Is this on? Hello, hi, my name is Jasmine Braxton. I'm an African American Studies and Criminal Justice double major. And I guess my question is, what advice do you have to student bodies to have these conversations outside of their own ethnic communities? Because Honestly, I'm a senior here, so it's just like, I've seen these difficult conversations happen. Like, I've seen people protest in front of administration, march to Lowe's house. I've seen people cry in front of McKeldin, and it's just like, inside our own group, we do have these difficult conversations, but it's just like, when it's time to talk about like things like the white space that came up, it's people who look like me. When it's time to talk about the different hate crimes that happen on campus, they are around people who look like me, so it's just like, when it's time to like come and have these conversations, I feel like there needs to be more diversity. And it's just like, oftentimes it's like, why don't we show up in a chemistry class with like 300 people in it and talk about diversity? And they're just like, oh, you can't be that radical or it's not part of the syllabus. So it's just like, how do we make people actually listen? Because it's one thing to offer these spaces because they are there, it's just like, people aren't showing up. So how do we get people to, a diverse group of people to show up? Yeah, I mean, just briefly, I think that is a real challenge on campuses. It's, some of the, it's one of the things that's come up as we've gone around to universities. Like, you know, what can catalyze this? And I think on each campus, it's a little bit different. You know, uh, one small liberal arts college, um, you know, they have these sort of tables where faculty bring together groups of students and you know traditionally it was on you know to speak a foreign language or on you know to talk about an era in history and they've started to do it about issues of race and inclusion and diversity and those tensions 
on campus. Uh, you know, in other settings, it's student government, you know, that, that brings together, you know, they fund all these different groups and organizations and they've used that authority and that, you know, money that they have to, uh, uh, you know, kind of encourage and incentivize these conversations, uh, engaging the leadership of different groups on campus, whether it's an athletic group or a group that's around, you know, a racial identity or a religious group. So, I don't have an answer. It takes leadership, and obviously, you know, I think Michelle's made a very good point about how, you know, that is sometimes uh, lacking. But it can be student leadership too. I think I go back to linguistics again, also, because if you're talking about diversifying a space, there is a sort of coda that that usually means invite all the people of color. <laughs> <laughs> and diversity programs are usually distinctly not diverse. And so, when you're talking about diversity and inclusion, you really have to understand what that really means and to be as diverse and inclusive as possible and make sure that you include, you know, um, straight white men, that you include um, members of the LGBT community, LGBTQ community, that you include people who have military experience, that you're really trying to cast a wide enough net and that's not just all the people of color come together in the student union and have a conversation amongst themselves about race. Last question. Thanks very much. Um, this has been terrific. I wanted to go back to a comment you made, Jelani, about the economic component to this. I've been trying to wrestle with this for a while because I think it's so important in terms of this question of structural change versus just dialogue. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but my understanding of the function of racism is to serve the economic elite that that's its role inside of capitalism, that's its role inside of our economy, is to um, divide and conquer the workers, um, to use, as people have articulated many times, racism whenever what should be happening is that the working class rises up against the people who hold all the power and the money, that racism is pulled out, xenophobia is pulled out, and people, uh, p white people's economic anxieties are funneled towards people of color and people from other countries and so forth and so on. But when you mentioned this about the economic piece going up, that the people further up the economic ladder were Trump supporters, I had a conversation with a guy right after the election with, uh, who was a Trump supporter. I'm a difficult dialogues uh, presenter, so this was my game. And it was very clear that he, his economic anxieties were, they're gonna take my money. I'm rich. Mm -hmm. They're gonna take my money. It was very clear um, that the economic anxiety was at the top as much as it was at the bottom for horrifying reasons as classism is. But anyway, I I've always felt like we're missing something central structurally in terms of how to dismantle racism if we don't see its function, which is to keep terrorizing people uh, who, who could be rising up against classism. And maybe I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. with your brains here, I wanted to see what you thought. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I think it's complicated. I don't think that there's a rationality to racism in, in the sense, so strictly economic sense. Uh, I think it has functional, has been useful for people in terms of economic exploitation, but people also do things that are irrational, uh, like, you know, businesses in marginal southern towns saying we don't serve Negroes, um, which would say that you place your racial sensibility above your socioeconomic sensibility. Uh, one of the big uh, objections to lynching, which is, you know, we've mentioned a while back, has been that white elites fought against it. White elites who were racist as poor white people were, um, but they recognized it as uh, something that would get in the way of them attracting investment. Uh, and so it's kind of a business decision. Like, we can't have dead Negroes swinging from lampposts. It makes us look bad, it makes the Chamber of Commerce have a hard time. Um, and so, but there were other, like economically marginal whites who should have been much more invested in that, who would have rather had the right to, um, to hang black people than to be better off. And you know, it was what Du Bois talked about with the psychological wage. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that, well, two quick things. One is when they're saying they're gonna take my money away. We should be very clear that the hostility toward taxation arose in American politics at the same time as the emergence of the civil rights movement and enfranchisement of significant numbers of black people. So it is not so much the state taking your revenue, it is taking that revenue on behalf of whom? Mm -hmm. yep. 
Um, yep. There was a point in this country where we actually built public institutions because we felt that the public was worth having really grand, illustrious institutions. You would not build a room like this for the public now because we say public including uh, people who may or may not be documented, uh, black people, people who may or may not be gay or lesbian or transgender or any, any group of people whom you deem to not be worthy of inclusion within the civic fabric, fabric. And by associating the government with the idea of working on behalf of those people, they've successfully been able to leverage that into hostility toward taxes. Um, and so those two things go together. Actually, Nancy McLean in her book, Democracy and Change, talks about that yeah. um, pretty explicitly. And the last thing I'll say about that is, um, is this, um, which you know, I was talking with someone after the election, and they were talking about uh, you know, white people who they said voted against their interests to vote for Donald Trump. And I said, I think that these are people who simply define their interests differently. And what I meant by that was that if you were to take an atheist to a church and say, this person has just given their last $5 to this institution, they would say that is a completely irrational act. They are acting against their best interest. But if you were to talk to a believer, they would say, this was consistent with my beliefs. And with that $5, I've purchased a sense of myself as faithful to the creed by which I live my life as part of a bigger community, that there are things that are more valuable to me than the economic value of that $5. In the United States, white supremacy has functioned very often in the ways like a faith, and that people will be willing to tithe on its behalf. And if that means tithing my health care, if that means tithing uh, a government that will um, in any way be concerned about whether I'm being exploited economically, about whether or not I have a, a living wage, I'm willing to tithe all those things. And to the people who are outside the faith of white supremacy, that appears to be an irrational act, just as irrational as the atheist sees the person giving their last $5. But with that, they've given up something, and they've gotten something much more valuable in their estimation in return. Just another source at the lower economic category is a fantastic book called The Politics of Resentment by a political scientist named Kathy Kramer. Mm -hmm. And she deals with literally how that functions with people who are low income. Mm -hmm. And to add one more to the syllabus, There Goes My Everything. Mm -hmm. by, is it Jason Sokol? Mm -hmm. Yes. Suzanne, any books you want to recommend? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, With I'll that, I know you, I know you. that concludes our panel discussion for the evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our Thank panel. You.